Today's episode is sponsored by AcreTrader. In the first third of 2022, both stocks and bonds were down. You've heard us talk about the importance of diversifying beyond just stocks and bonds alone. And if you're looking for an asset that can help you diversify your portfolio and provide a potential hedge against inflation and rising food prices, look no further than farmland. Now, you may be thinking, Meb, I don't want to fly to a rural area, work with a broker I've never met before, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a farm, and then go figure out how to run it myself. But that's where AcreTrader comes in. AcreTrader is an investment platform that makes it simple to own shares of farmland and earn passive income. And you can start investing in just minutes online. I personally invested on AcreTrader can say it was an easy process. If you want to learn more about AcreTrader, check out episode 312 when I spoke with founder Carter Malloy. Scott, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on the show, Matt. Where do we find you today? I'm in Athens, Georgia. You know, my wife was a PhD right down the road at Emory. And uh, as you and I were joking in the intro, my mom was a bulldog briefly, but probably like a lot of Georgia grads, you know, I don't think she made it to the finish line. So, right. Mom, there are a lot of bars in Athens. There are a lot of yeah. bars in Athens. Yeah. Uh, an awesome city. You have a new book out that I loved and I read um, called Oceans of Grain. The interesting part about the book, is if you hear that title, you may think it's just about farming or about wheat, because uh, the subtitle is How American Wheat Remade the World. But really, it's at its core a history book. Um, if, if, I mean, I, I'm telling the author that, but that's what it felt like. So you can <laughs> yeah. correct me. But I think I heard you say in passing, or maybe it was in the book, but this has been a um, project you've been that's been on the brain for a while. So give us a little backstory on uh, what, uh, what inspired you to write this and then we'll, we'll dig in. Yeah. So part, part back to empire, you know, it's it, empire is something that I've been uh, interested in thinking about for a while, but I guess it's 1987. I finished my honors thesis on uh, iron and steel industry. And I realized that this thing called the panic of 1873 that I had read about and had been written a lot about was wrong. That it was basically the story that most Americans had, uh, most American historians had, which is that the Panic of 1873 was this formative moment, creates American industrialization, is the background for the birth of the large corporation and things like that. That that it was this origin story was different, um, and I just knew it was wrong in 1987, but I didn't know why it was wrong, and so the kind of the those uh, those years since then have been, you know, 30 some years since then has, has been trying to figure out what that origin story is. And it turns out, I think that the origin story of American industrialization, geopolitical power is not the st standard things, it, industrial capacity, engineering, uh, supremacy, those sorts of things, it's really about food. It's really about uh, replacing Russia as the breadbasket of Europe. And that's really this. The story is why does how does Russia become the breadbasket of Europe in the 1770s and 80s, and then how does the U.S. steal a march on Russia uh, in the 1860s, really during the Civil War, and um, that's that's telling the story of Russia-U.S. tensions going all the way back to the 1790s is in a way, um, what the story is about. And it's also about food and geopolitics and trade and stuff like that. Well, I mean, it, it's um, sadly timely, but, um, you know, it's it's funny because you you see the front of the discussion today with everything going on and um, all of a sudden everyone, you know, Ukraine and Russia and ag prices are all thrust into the forefront. But this has been, you know, something you've clearly been, uh, been thinking about working um, on for a while. So, Let's start at the beginning, man. Um, take us back. You know, wheat. Uh, wheat has a special place in my heart because, and part of your story that you write is a story of like my family. So my my father's side immigrated from, uh, you know, Germany and France into uh, Nebraska, and he grew up on a farm um, in a, a tiny town called Holstein, Nebraska. So, um, you know, it, we, we still have family and farmland in Kansas, and Nebraska today. So yeah, we talk a lot about my um, very uh, um, inept experience at trying to be a farmer. Uh, so 
but it's a it's a fun story. So anyway, to, to talk to us a little bit about you know why why this topic of wheat is is in many ways a a timeline of human history and development. Just dig in. Yeah. So wheat is energy, right? And so we measure wheat. When we measure food, we talk about calories. And we talk when we talk about gas and oil, we talk about calories. When we talk about like calories are a measurement of energy and the primary source of energy that we sh have shared for 10,000 years has been um, has been wheat food. Um, wheat is the kind of famine food. It's the food that you go to last. Um, you eat it every day, but it's the last thing, you know, uh, you'll eat it and it travels pretty well. Um, and so if you, uh, part of what I figured out as I was kind of wrestling with this question of economic development, geopolitics and conflict was that um, if you look at the way in which food moves around, you can actually see empires in the making and you can see the weak points of empires. And my man crush, this guy, um, uh, Israel Helfand, also called Parvis, he um, wrote about this as I was you know, th thinking and writing about this. I wrote a couple of articles about uh, grain and stuff like that. And I realized I was effectively cribbing this guy. He was writing in the 1880s and 90s saying the same thing, that America supplants Russia, that it's producing all this food, and it's destabilizing Europe. And he's not somebody to take lightly because he's the person who persuades the German government during World War I to send a sealed train of Bolsheviks to the Finland station to start the Russian Revolution. He's the architect, in some ways, of the Russian Revolution. So he's um, his his sort of understanding of food and its and and how it travels and where the weak points are, where the strong points are, um, is for him uh, really how to understand politics in his day and uh, in the present day. And thinking through putting on Parvis goggles in that book, I I said somewhat grandly, you know, that Russia would never be a great power again without control of Ukraine and. That was weirdly prescient because the book came out in February of um, 22nd and Putin invaded two days later. And we now know that his plan is to control much of the northern part of the Black Sea, much in the way that, you know, Catherine the Great, that was Catherine the Great's plan. That was, that was, that's been the plan of uh, the Russian Empire for uh, going back centuries. So dig in a little more for us um, while we're while we're talking about it, Ukraine and Russia, the conflict. Um, give us a little more on the history. You, know, you talk about the Ukraine flag. You talk about the history of the conflict. Um, give us give us a little more background on kind of the the lead in to uh, this year. It's not something that just kind of started in twenty twenty two. Right. So I think, you know, people think that this is a new conflict, uh, Russia's war over Ukraine that has something to do with the NATO or something to do with the UN. But from a longer term perspective, this is the 10th war uh, in the last 250 years in which Russia has invaded this region to try to control the Black Sea, uh, which they see as a really crucial geopolitical point. It's the place where food comes from and has been since uh, roughly 2800 BC. Jason and the Argonauts, the story is arguably a story about wheat. So that's the, the uh, golden fleece is really uh, grain that's discovered in the Black Sea and then brought back to feed the Greek city-states. But Russia has always had designs on the Black Sea because in the Greek world, the ancient Greek world, that was the feeding place for Europe. For uh, and and when uh, Catherine the Great creates the city of Odessa, she names it after Odessos, which was an old Black Sea port uh, in the in the ancient Greek period. Ukraine is the sort of Goldilocks zone. You've got deep ports, deep water. You've got fresh water coming in. You've got flat plains. You've got very very dark soil. So it's a kind of Goldilocks zone. It's the perfect place to grow grain and has been feeding uh, empires really for thousands of years. Russia uh, wants that, wanted, wanted control of that. And when it took Ukraine uh, in the 1770s, it basically allowed Russia to become a world-spanning empire. It's after they take uh, the Black Sea, after Odessa becomes the source of gold for uh, the foreign exchange for, for Russia, it's able to expand rapidly uh, west towards Europe and east 
towards Asia. And the reason the Russian Empire is the size it was is really um, not just because it's got a great army and not just because it's, you know, um, a, a military might. All that military might, all that wealth really comes from the ability to provide food to the rest of the world. You know, the um, and you can correct me if this is inc- if this is wrong, but the, the Ukraine flag represents blue sky over sea of grain. Is that right? That's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Ukraine recognizes that uh, as a you know separate, separate country, it re- recognizes the importance of grain. And it's, um, you know, arguably one of the best places in the world to grow grain. It, uh, not to put your parents and uh, your great grandparents in Nebraska uh, to shame, you know, but uh, the folks who came from Germany to France they, and Nebraska is, a, is an excellent place. But it's pretty far away if you think about it from deep water. And if we're talking about energy, when we're talking about grain, we need to talk about getting it on the ocean because friction is so much lower on water than it is on land. Uh, 90% of international trade is still takes place in containers. It takes place in containers now because water is a low friction environment and beats the hell out of rail or road or anything else like that. Um, and so what you want is deep, flat plains, fresh water, uh, right near a deep port where you can pour it into uh, a ship and send it anywhere in the world. And that's that's kind of what Ukraine has and what Nebraska, Nebraska says everything but <laughs> the uh, the river that goes somehow to, uh, to the ocean. Yeah, we're seeing this reminder that, you know, food security often in the US, I feel like is, is back of mind, you know, you can go to the grocery store and see just rows and rows of food but for much of the world you know the um impact of food prices we had inflation today i think print over nine percent in the u.s um which is obviously uh not great and inconvenient but in many countries it's a huge stressor geopolitical you know in in africa and i mean you know europe all the protests putting your your historical lens your magnifying glass or whatever um, on sort of this situation. Are there any parallels, any sort of, you know, insights you can draw from what's going on today and kind of looking out to the horizon on just like the stressors? I'm not going to predict, ask you to predict what's going to happen in Ukraine and Russia. You can if you want, but um, just any general thoughts on this as, as you apply the lens of history? Yeah. Um, so if we think, I, I would say that one of the things, if we think about the United States, is that um, household uh, expenditure is roughly 25% on food, 20, 25%. It's the lowest just about in the world. Uh, so our household income spent on food is a relatively low amount. We have cheap food. Uh, and there are other places, you know, the Netherlands actually has pretty cheap food because of all the, um, you know, cows and uh, dairy and stuff like that in here there. So it's not just um, big states with flat plains. Um, But in places like Egypt, places like Nigeria, places um, that were actually on the fringe of the old Byzantine Empire, uh, fringe of the old Ottoman Empire, uh, the northern part of the uh, southern Mediterranean, those places have been eating grain for 300 years and 40 to 50 percent of household expenditure is on food. That's a huge difference, right? So price of um, grain goes up, price of flour goes up, price of wheat uh, bread goes up, and um, it, you, that's a difference between being able to pay for your rent or not, a uh, difference between you're being able to feed your kids or not, and that makes people very angry. So we had a drought in 2011 uh, in Russia, and Russia blocked the export of wheat, and Arab Spring was in some ways the result, the direct result of that. Uh, people being very upset about the price of food going up. Um, you know, at the time, people were saying it's cell phones, it's, you know, a new democracy movement. But we saw incredible chaos and instability, the Syrian, you know, exodus, uh, the collapse of those states have had everything to do with food, uh, with food prices. And so what we're seeing here is a much more kind of artificial um, restriction in grain, having everything to do with the war. And two of the biggest exporters in the world are Russia and Ukraine. Russia has blockaded Ukrainian grain, and um, this has effectively rapidly increased the price of Russian grain exports, which is stabilizing the ruble, but uh, you know, puts, puts Ukraine in a terrible bind. 
so this this is this is a a green story i think uh in in part and you know putin is not putin's master's thesis uh putin did do a master's thesis it was on geopolitics of critical infrastructure but but particularly what he called the agro-industrial state so the way in which uh, industry depends ultimately on cheap and stable agriculture. China is, of course, obsessed with uh, this. This is why they don't, China doesn't allow uh, or tries to block as much imported food as possible because it wants food security. Uh, we, weirdly, when my book came out, like before it even hit the stands, five Chinese publishers competed for the Ch Chinese rights for this because a story about understanding the world through the politics of food is something that they're very keen on in China uh, right now. So the food security thing, I think, is a little bit of a, I, I don't like the phrase food security that much, just because I think there's some places like the Caribbean where you'll never be able to feed yourself with what's on your island, right? Uh, and we all need each other to feed ourselves. You know, we're not going to grow coffee uh, in the United States. Um, and uh, there, there are places that, that need grain, like Greenland, that are not going to grow grain themselves. And so I think that kind of inter, interconnected part, we all need a kind of world market in food. And to the extent that we withdraw from that, I think then we risk conflict, war, and, and violence. So as long as the, those trading uh, gates are open, then I feel like we're in better shape than not. I want to rewind a little bit. We jumped, we jumped forward and now let's rewind back a bit because part of um, a lot of the topics and themes about this book, you know, in, in many ways, it's um, a history of America's ascent. Uh, and you talk about a lot of like little tidbits. This is where I love the book, you know, that it, and I don't want to give away uh, everything, but um, listeners, you got to go pick up a copy, but um but there's little tidbits you just pick up and it talks about everything with, you know, wheat's association with the first capitalists, predecessor to banking and collateral, the world's lords and late, I mean, on and on. So maybe tell us like some of the things that you wrote about or learned about how this, you know, grains played a role in just various um, parts of history, but also the ascent of America as well. Sure. Grain is, is um, it's one of the so, sort of, so the Eleusinian mysteries, one of the things that I talk about is the secret of Persephone, right? Persephone and Demeter, it's an old uh, ancient Greek story. And I argue that it's a story about grain storage. It's not about planting grain, but Persephone is the daughter of Demeter and, the, and she is trapped in the underworld for six months and then she comes out later. And, and I say that that's not a story about planting. It's a story about how to store grain for an empire, uh, first for the Greek empire and then later. And that secret is actually lost from about uh, 300 AD to about 1820 AD. We lose the secret of being able to store grain underground and or store grain in a sealed container so that it doesn't spoil. And it's only when uh, Napoleon invades Italy uh, in, the, in those Italian campaigns that he sends a bunch of chemists out to try to reverse engineer how the Romans might have been storing grain. And uh, Chaptal, this chemist, figures it out, figures out the secret of Persephone, which is basically you have to take the grain, you have to dry it, and you have to stir it, and you have to get it to around 20% or less liquid in the, in the mixture. Um, and once you do that, you can seal it and you can store it for years in that way. And that's where we get the silo, the grain silo, and that's where we get the grain elevator. And that's really important, the grain silo and grain elevator, because they allow you to travel, to send grain for thousands of miles uh, away, if, rediscovering the secret of Persephone. And that's crucial to the United States because the United States is thousands of miles away from Europe, but it's after 1825 that the US can now send grain, dry it and send it sealed to, to feed the rest of the world. Most Europeans thought it was crazy to get your food from that far away. You know, it was like, like shoeing, taking a Scottish horse and shoeing it in New York and then sending it back to Scotland. You wouldn't go that far away for grain, but, but that it becomes possible to send grain over long distances that way. Other stuff, yeah, uh, Lord and Lady are both words for grain is so baked into 
empire and organization and structure that the word Lord is Hofward, Old Germanic, which means the Lord of the Loaf. Uh, and Lady is Hlaftige, uh, the kneader of the loaf. And so that's because ancient medieval societies were built around grain and the person who controlled the grain was the Lord and the person who distributed the grain was the lady. And in those uh, that medieval uh, hierarchical society, the gospels are in part a, a story about, um, you know, uh, Christ as a loaf of bread, right? And, and the way in which the loaf of bread is a kind of everyday uh, source for everyone and making an origin story that, you know, this is my blood, this is my body is, um, is a way of kind of making visible to people the sort of understanding of what's kind of fundamental in their societies. Um, yeah, and, and then I guess nitroglycerin is the other thing. There's a little, this, the book is a little bit of a hymn to nitroglycerin because nitroglycerin allows us to penetrate the lithosphere. 125,000 um, atmospheres can be produced in a single boom, and which takes a microsecond. And that power is 50 times more powerful than gunpowder, and it allows us to put uh, holes in mountains. And this is another thing that allows the US to provide food so from so far away is between 1868 and 1872, nitroglycerin is stabilized as dynamite uh, by Nobel in 1868. And between 1868 and 1872, every mountain in the world, with the exception of the Himalayas, is penetrated uh, to produce tunnels for railroads. And the, the book Around the World in 80 Days is a story about that ability of a post-penetrated world to get goods around. So we, that we see kind of global globalization um, and really long conflict, long uh, trade, serious trade between the Americas and Europe uh, is really only possible uh, after the nitroglycerin and after um, this discovery of how to how to ship grain. So it's interesting to think about like the parallels when you're talking about, um, uh, you know, the build out of railroads, the telegraph and kind of how all these various, uh, you know, impacts um you know, are partially driven by things no one would have anticipated or I think appreciated as much, um, which I think is is fascinating. I think part of what I'm trying to do with, with the U.S. is make it less focused on itself. So make us recognize that Chicago wanted to be Odessa, right? Chicago, that was that was Chicago's goal was to be the Odessa of the world. Uh, Odessa was the goal because that was the deep port that provided grain for the rest of the world. And Chicago becomes that really during the Civil War um, when you know you have, you have a crisis over the westward expansion of, of slavery and, um, and the US suddenly needs foreign exchange in just the way that Catherine the Great did. And the way that they provide it is with um, uh, you know, providing all this grain over the, over the Atlantic Ocean. There's a participant in your book that you haven't mentioned yet um that plays a big role and uh it's a bug right uh you're yeah. pestis did <laughs> right. i pronounce it right you're sitting, yeah you're sending pestis yeah you're sending pestis uh tell tell the listeners who that is and uh why they uh why they were featured uh so your pestis is what we now call the plague um the black plague and it's um it travels in the bloodstream so it's actually uh, a pest that's that's what you you can't see and it travels in the bloodstream of a flea of a rat and in humans uh briefly and we pass this on uh, so it can, the, the method of transmission is usually the flea that goes from a human to a rat and vice versa and uh and rats eat grain and so part of the way that the plague travels is over grain roots so when we we um when we look at say the black plague in the plague of justinian which is you know the end of the ancient world and the beginning of the middle ages in uh, around 900 uh that takes place as all these black paths that i talk about for grain grain distribution become the distribution centers for yersinia pestis and yersinia pestis travels all through these regions and destabilizes international trade Put, sets us back a thousand years and uh, particularly Europe sets Europe back a thousand years into what 
you know, is a kind of dark age. And the, the, the Europe is basically providing its own food and not getting its food from the Mediterranean for a while. It's not getting a lot of things from the Mediterranean. We see monasteries and we see the kind of closing up of a society for, for 500 years. Uh, you know, a similar thing happens in the 17th century when plague ships bring about the kind of end of the middle, the Renaissance and the birth of a kind of capitalist world system that we have. Um, but there was another plague, another Yersinia pestis that was recently discovered in science and nature 2019, um, the predecessor to this, 2800 BC. And it starts just uh, in, a, in a town that no longer exists, but existed in 2800 BC, uh, just south of Kiev. And we can tell from Yersinia pestis inside the teeth of people who were exhumed from those places, that the plague traveled from Kiev all the way to Manchuria, all the way to Sweden in the space of about 500 years. We also know from next generation genome sequencing that no human made that travel over those 500 years. So that no, there was no, there weren't enough, there weren't people that could travel that distance. We know that from genetic drift, that the people were genetically, you know, isolated. And yet, Yersinia pestis is able to, this tiny little in insect is able to move all that distance. And what that says is that we had trade before we had empires. We had trade um, 5,000 years ago, uh, a network of trade that uh, no individual made that distance, but a bunch of people, you know, 40, 60 miles were sending wheat or other goods over those distances. And so we have this, uh, Yersinia pestis lets us see in the teeth of people that, that we had this long distance trading network before we had empires, before we had, well, we had writing, but not much. We had, you know, domesticated animals, but not a whole lot. We had a uh, not the kind of uh, hierarchical societies that we're used to. But before all of that, we had long distance trade. And that's another reason why I, I don't like that idea of food security, because we've never been secure in our food. We've always depended on people over long distances for our food. And um, and if we forget that, then we we start to retreat into this sort of World War I, World War II thinking where, you know, the Axis powers can defeat the allies and vice versa. And that's, um, you know, that's a path of danger, I think. Yeah, there's a handful of other questions I want to get to uh, as well. But while while we're on the topic of the book, what was you can either one or just an entire narrative or thread. But what, what was kind of like one of your favorite or unexpected insights from, you know, the research that went into this book where you kind of there was an idea or concept that either wasn't known to you or you said, oh, this is super cool. I didn't know this. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I would say it's the Black Paths, this this Chorny uh, uh is the Ukrainian term for it. Uh, and these Black Paths are described in a lot of ancient documents in old Rus uh, documents and things like that from eight and 900 uh, AD. And they describe the path of the Chumaki. Uh, and I, it, Chumaki was a word I liked. I don't know why I was interested in these grain traders, these people who were carrying ox and they traveled in groups of about a hundred uh with uh an ox and they each carried about uh two thousand pounds and they traveled over long distances uh, bringing grain in one direction uh some sometimes leather and slaves uh in in other directions and uh, a folklorist interviewed these chumaki in the 1860s in russia and they said we've existed since before the ancient Greek empires. The Chumaki have crossed the planet for long before then. And that's why we have these ancient rituals. That's why we have these ancient horns. That's why there's a, there's a lot of religious ritual that's very poorly understood that comes out of the Chumaki, uh, these grain traders. And so the 2019 discoveries of this grain network showed that, in fact, you know, these must be the the ancestors to the Chumaki. These must have been these traders that had been traveling over long distances. Um, but Chumaki is a funny word because Chuma, and this took me a while because my, <laughs> my Russian's okay, my Ukrainian's not so good. Chuma means plague. And Chumaki are the people who carry the goods, but they also carry the plague. Uh, so the word is related. And then the, the uh, and this is does reach inter, uh, interplanetary uh, sense as well, because the Milky Way, 
for Ukrainians is Chumatsky way, right? And it's the path of the Chumaks. Uh, as they see it, um, they use, of course, the Milky Way at night to uh, navigate, to know that they're going in the right direction to, to bring grain along. So the Chumaki were that, that's, and the Chumaki, if you spend any time in, in uh, Ukraine, you know that, that, that the Chumaki is on the coin and the Chumaki are a kind of uh, among the fables that are really important part of Ukrainian lore. And uh, so I think that part of it, uh, I, I had German in, in high school and I had Russian in college, but learning uh, a lot of the Ukrainian folklore and then this, this guy Parvis that I write about, his understanding of these black paths, his way of putting the world together uh, in that way made me rethink geopolitics a lot. Uh, made me think reading Marxism a lot too, because he was a Marxist, but a very strange kind of Marxist. Um, and one that um, made me kind of reassess a lot of what I thought I knew about how the economy worked. Well, that's a perfect transition uh, because you've written a bunch of books. How many? We got six? You over half Something a dozen like that. now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, one of um, something we think a lot about uh, in general, or at least, um, uh, is it kind of a story of of history in in my world uh, that you wrote a book about? I haven't read it, so I, I want to preview. And I'm not going to say what is your favorite financial disaster in America because that's the wrong way to phrase it. But what, maybe what's the most interesting? Because some of these go back, you know, hundreds of years, and sometimes they rhyme, and sometimes they're different. Um, tell us, uh, tell us uh, some quick insights on that book, because I am uh, I'm putting in a one click order on Amazon right now. So this should be here by this should be here by Friday. This is Nation of Deadbeats. Mm -hmm. You're talking about? Yeah, so I wrote Nation of Deadbeats. Um, so that was a funny thing. I, I origin of that is odd, because in 2009, I guess I was uh, eight and nine, I was reading about what was going on in the markets. And I heard a lot of people talking about the Great Depression. And I said, this is not the great, you know, the 1929 depression. No, this is, or the thirties. This is not, you know, there's nothing, nothing like that. And I said, said, it's more like the 1873 thing. And so the Chronicle of Higher Ed asked me to write a piece about it. And so I wrote a piece about how this, this thing that we were experiencing in 2008 and nine was more like the panic of 1873 and the editor sent it back and she said, all right, that's true. Put your money where your mouth is. Name five, you know, say say name five things that might happen if if this is like 1873. So I said, well, denomination of trade might change from the dollar to the renminbi. The um, you know, gold might be much more valuable over time, and uh, cash on hand would become uh, more valuable uh, than other stocks on hand. And um, and and in the space of basically a couple of months, all the things that I predicted might happen, happen. And so then I started getting all these calls initially from banks, uh, first from fund analysts, and then from fund managers um, saying, tell me more about <laughs> iron prices. Tell me more about cash is king. Tell me more about, you know, why a liquidity crisis crash is different from a, you know, these other crashes, because none of our economists know anything about this. And I, you know, that was, it was interesting to me. And I said, well, why is that? What? And I think part of it is that the monetarist explanation for financial panics, which comes from Milton Friedman and is more or less our standard explanation for how that you change the money supply, you can affect the economy, you change the interest rate and you can change the economy. That was Milton Friedman's argument, and it's now what most economists believe. But once Milton Friedman's book came out in 64, people dropped studying all the other crises because they said, well, we understand it now. There's no, reason to, there's no reason to look at these other crises because the data is not as good and we've already solved this crisis. We're never going to have a crisis like that again. Um, and so the, the, one of these guys, I think it was from BlackRock, said, well, what's a book on all the financial crises? And I thought, well, oh, there, must be, <laughs> there must be a book on this. And um, I realized there wasn't. And so that's why I wrote Nation of Deadbeats, was to sort of tell a story of all the other crises. And with the, you know, the punchline of the book, a few of them, one of them is that commodity, commodities are a really crucial thing, that commodities signal crises in a way. Um, what the commodity is is different for different crises. Another takeaway is um, that personal debt is actually crucial, that we think of personal debt as being 
something that started in you know with the credit card in the 1970s but actually personal debt goes all the way back to the 1780s and 1790s with country stores and you know providing credit for goods and so um why and the reason it's called nation of deadbeats is is that it's lots and lots and lots of small borrowers farmers really who can't make their payments uh, for reasons having to do with rapid changes in commodity prices that then spiral out into these other uh financial calamities and so the nation of deadbeats book was a book that forced me to uh sharpen my financial reading skills i had done financial history in school but i needed uh, I really need to understand bills of exchange. I really need to understand the silver agio, uh, all these other things that most historians don't study and most economists don't study, frankly, you know, the instruments and how the instruments are a problem, treasury bills and all these sorts of things. And that a lot, the, I learned a lot about that. And that actually helped me write Oceans of Grain because I started to understand in the way in which credit instruments are crucial to understanding the economy and what capitalism is, for example. Yeah, I mean, like the development of future contracts, right? Like that's something that um, very much is a uh, ag, you know, um, a very big ag sort of development. The word capitalism usually refers to Venice and and Genoa in the 14th century. Uh, the be- development of a kind of future, like a uh, not a futures market, but a kind of forward market in which you know the goods are going to be delivered over time and you can hold an instrument and the instrument increases in value over time and that's you know kind of what many economists and historians would say is the beginning of capitalism and understanding the difference between that and what we the modern futures market which is an anonymous market like the forward market was you knew who the traders were uh the futures market is an in, in, you know the the future is you don't know who the final buyer is in a futures market uh that's one of the key differences and then how a how it basically this provides financial credit a much more labile and uh, flexible way of providing credit to farmers than the country store was, and that's a thing that I, that's really important for understanding how the U.S. becomes um, the kind of king of markets uh, by the eighteen seventies eighteen eighties. I'm not sure if we're going through. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lead you. I'm going to, is, is any, what does anything, uh, any parallels in history kind of where we are with 2022? So we got a pan, we had a pandemic, we got a war going on, we have markets kind of rolling over and, and something particularly a lot of the young people haven't experienced in their lifetime is really in the U S they've experienced it in many other countries, but, um, inflation, are there any analogs you say, ah, this reminds me of 17 something or other. Uh, yeah, let me think. Well, one of the things that has become that we used to that we think of as invisible, but we now COVID made us made visible to us as supply chains. Ten years ago, people were not talking about supply chains unless they were logistics professionals. Uh, but now we understand that the reason we go into the grocery store six months ago and couldn't get any chicken was because of supply, even though chicken, you know, the U.S. produces nothing but chickens, uh, it's a big, you know, the world's biggest producer of chickens. So we start to understand supply chains, and I think that helps us understand what's what's happened. I think just in terms of the inflation is a is a I think a bad word for describing what we're talking about when we're talking about problems. We need to be talking about strains on those black paths, strains on internal logistics that are important for the, for an economy. And and so the World Bank, for example, says. Um, and, and the UN World Food Program says, if you take the cost to deliver goods in cents per ton kilometer over a certain distance inside a country, and you multiply it by 689, you get GDP of that country, all like a, with a 0.9 correlation. I mean, that's nobody gets a 0.9 correlation like that. Like that's an impossible correlation. So why is it that the cost to deliver goods in cents per ton mile inside a country is this, the GDP. It doesn't make any sense. And I think it, I think that's because when we're talking about our ability to produce and consume and our ability to kind of feed ourselves uh, and be plugged into this international world market, um, the speed at which we can deliver, speed and cheapness at which we can deliver energy 
over a long distance is the economy, right? So, so that to me is is why the paths matter. That we that we have a formula for economics and inflation and deflation and ideas about tr treasury and you know TED spreads and stuff like that, but we don't really have a geographical explanation for the economy. And once we start to do that, once we really start to understand how the economy is geographically constrained by its ability to deliver energy over a long distance, then we can talk about, you know, an, and, and this is why, you know, just look at China, the, the number of high speed rails that have been built in China over the last 10 years. That's how you do it, right? That's if you can more efficiently and quickly deliver energy over a long distance cheaply, then you build GDP. And that's precisely what Ch China has been doing. And so I guess the, the, ins the big insight for me in the book and just in terms of crises is when we think about crises, we shouldn't be thinking about dollars or we shouldn't th be thinking about value. We should be thinking about those chains and are they, what's the cost of them? Is, is the price of the energy in those things going up or down? And are there ways of cheapening the delivery of those goods from one place to another. And that's, I think, what we need to think about when we think about uh, the economy. I hope that's a, <laughs> that's a little bit of off. <laughs> it's great. I mean, like, you know, one of the things that I can't answer, uh, you may have some insight, but it, you can also just uh, pass on this too, is like, as you kind of look at the landscape of the world today and, and look to the horizon, uh, prediction being the wrong word, but is there anything you see as like, as you study these, crises as you've written this book about you know ag as we look forward you're like you know what this seems to me to be um a big problem going forward or you know what if i could call biden today i would tell him to do xyz um or uh you know the if if so and so rang me um just any any general any general thoughts pretty open ended question i suppose um one thing we should be paying more attention to is the China's Belt and Road Initiative, which which is very much about building those black paths with China at the center. And that this is not just a side project. This is not just an opportunity to find investment in India or Vietnam or Iran. It's not just um, you know an attempt to build um, political relationships between China and the rest of the world. It's the Belt and Road Initiative is very much about um, creating uh, an infrastructure for delivery that cheapens the flow of those goods back and forth. That that is um, a powerful economic development. And where does the Belt and Road Initiative come? It comes after two thousand eight. It comes after um, China is persuaded that the that the dollar is the wrong currency for world trade, um, and China has very much tried to change that tried to change it to the RMB, they, they uh, created a, an infrastructural banking system that was a competitor to uh, the World Bank. It hasn't done especially well, um, but it's also funded this Belt and Road Initiative, which is an attempt to kind of build those corridors. And I think rather than you know saying this is a threat to us or something like that, we as a country in the, you know, well, I'm a citizen of the world, right, is that that we need to be thinking about joining the world together. I suppose many of my friends who were see themselves as kind of on the left and Marxists and stuff like that are very nationalistic in a way and very much want to believe in blocking external goods. And I, I the thing I'd say to them is that's not what Lenin believed. That's not what Marx believed. That's not what Trotsky believed. That's not what Parvis believed. That, that Marxists in the 19th century believed that free trade was the root to a, a world economy in which workers would be powerful and important. Um, somehow we've lost that, I think. Somehow people who see themselves as being kind of liberals or on the left have lost that internationalism uh, to a certain extent. And um, I, I'd argue that we need to recognize that the more we join the world together, we kind of build together. And uh, that's my, I suppose my fear is about a is about a world war, and I believe that that's the direction that we're headed in in many ways. Uh, the head of Belarus uh, just recently said this that this is he sees these signs, and he's been sort of leaking to us Putin's plans, thankfully, which is about control of the northern end of the Black Sea, not just Ukraine, but potentially Romania, potentially even 
Istanbul, uh, which is not a surprise. You know, it's 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 been on the it's been on their route for been on the been the plan for the Russian Empire since there was a Russian Empire. Um, so we need open direct communication between these places which are not controlled by empires but which are which are open to many people and multiple buyers and sellers and that that's that's the way forward and when that closes down when we start nationalizing or closing off those routes then i get scared yeah as we start to wind down here so uh are, are you teaching classes at all now what uh what's on your brain on the summertime you know you got the book you burst this new book out into the world. Um, are you yeah. uh, taking a sabbatical or what's, what do you think no, about well, now? Well, no, so I've done like, so it's the, since the book came out, I mean, it's been really amazing because it's, you know, it's going to be translated now in seven languages, including simplified and complex Chinese, Japanese, and Russian, and all these other sorts of things, but being on these podcasts and all these TV and radio stations all over the world, not in the US so much, but in South Korea and in Denmark, in uh, Germany and in the Netherlands, um, where they, you know, care a lot about uh, f food and um, those sorts of things. I've learned a whole lot more about how how grain works and how this international trade works. So I've, we, if I could rewrite the book, there are a lot of things that I've learned from other experts, right? The head of the World Food Program, grain traders, commodities traders, and things like that. Uh, the things that I wish I had known when I had written the book. So the, the, um, it's one of those cases where I think it's never happened before, where I learned a whole lot more about what I was writing after the book was done. And that's exciting. But yeah, the next project I do, I'm interested in the 66 million year ago, the KT extinction. Uh, there's been a lot of good new scientific research about. What is that? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> so that's the death of the dinosaurs, the KT extinction. Ah. And, um, but it's, it's, what's important about it is that it basically reshapes the world in all these ways. It's the reason that we're mammals and not, you know, dinosaurs uh, is, this asteroid that hit and broke into six pieces and created the Gulf of Mexico. And a lot of things that were speculation are, we are now pretty much settled. Uh, there were something like three years of total darkness and, and that killed most of the plants and all of the plant eaters and all of the things they ate the plant eaters like T-Rex and things like that. And all that was left were the bottom feeders, um, alligators and things like that. And then uh, us, basically our ancestors, the mice that had very, very well-developed stomachs that could process almost anything, could eat, could, could basically eat uh, refuge, refuse from dead animals. And so this is why, uh, it, you know, mammals that can regulate their own body temperature and can uh, digest almost anything uh, because of our internal gut flora are the people that have survived and but it's there's a way in which our whole world is shaped by these this reconstruction of the planet that is interesting to me like the fall line in the united states between the hilly region which was above ground and the ocean region which is which was then underwater is where all of our all our cities are now and along the east coast and much of the world is uh, those places where the fall line is. And that has to do with this extinction 66 million years ago. So I'm still about the Black Paths and about this trade, but thinking about it in a kind of larger context. Um, mostly I'm playing games though. So I was gonna say, I'm gonna replay that for my, uh, my son. Next time he asked me about uh, the, the, my five-year-old, I say, what's this dinosaur thing? So I don't know the answer, but listen, listen to the Meb Favor Show podcast. We got an answer for you games what do you mean games we're talking board games we're talking video games we're talking yeah video uh, games, games. You know. yeah 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 so video games I, I i um you know i'm a big pokemon go player because it forces me to walk all the time and so i do a lot of walking about five or six miles a day and uh you know it's it's uh it's if you think about pokemon go it's a series of partial differential equations uh and so that's the math part of me loves that uh aspect of, of the Game Stellaris is this kind of world uh, universe building game that takes like, the, you know, took me two months to figure out how to play the game. <laughs> um, but it's it's a kind of, yeah, it's a kind of um, logistics and and um, kind of world, you know, empire kind of, kind of game. And um, yeah, that's, that's 
pretty much board games with the family and things like that. Uh, but uh, I've been my, my wife says I'm much more boring now. I used to talk about Persephone and everything that I was doing research on. And now that I'm sort of uh, finished with the book, my, my big white whale, I'm much less of an interesting person, she says. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, with games, but mostly they're on the, the five-year-old level, but many of them are, um, you know, as fun and as challenging. I was uh, uh, at a recent hotel where they had a bunch of old Galaga, Frogger, uh, what else, Pac-Man uh, that we got to play for the first time, but um, I, uh, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of games of all types. Scott, this has been a lot of fun. Where um, people, <clears throat> listeners, pick up his uh, new book, Oceans of Grain, on Amazon, and anywhere good books are found. Um, is there anything, if people want to follow you, uh, homepage, Twitter, are you? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm on Twitter, Nels, at Nelson Hist. Scott Reynolds, Nelson.com is the website, which I, I, I have to say, I haven't, I've been, uh, not been updating, but I should uh, have more links to the reviews of the book and summaries. Um, yeah, that's, uh, but, but Twitter has been my home and then Facebook, of course, um, has been where mostly how I connect with other scholars and things like that. I, I'm not a big social media consumer, but it's, it's how I keep in touch with my old students and things like that. Oh, and, and so I missed it. Are you uh, are you teaching classes anymore? Or is that? Uh, oh yeah, much, much yeah. Summer? Oh yeah. No, no. I'm teaching. I'm teaching a research seminar in the fall. In the spring, I'm teaching a history of technology course. Uh, and, uh, and so that has been. Fun. I was a I was a science person. You know, I was a math physics undergrad, and um, so I uh, was a hacker uh, back before uh, back when it was uh, you could get away with it. And um, part of uh, what I uh, am interested in is sort of th thinking about technologies and how they relate to uh, the sort of world and world economy. Well, very cool. That'll be the topic of our next podcast. Uh, we got to save, save some time for uh, episode two. Uh, it has been a delight. Scott, thanks so much for joining us today. Meb, thank you. It's great talking to you and uh, great to talk to somebody who uh, enjoys um, both uh, research and leisure uh, equally. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. aren't a lot of a lot of people that admit that. So 